hello there and welcome to another episode of the Religious Studies Project. It's Monday afternoon. That means it must be time for another fascinating interview. I'm David Robertson. And I'm Gandalf the Grey. <laughs> He's Christopher Cotter. And we're about to hear an interview with Lynn Davidman, as recorded by our good friend Dusty Hosley. And the subject this week is conversion and deconversion as concepts in the sociology of religion. This was recorded at the Association for the Sociology of Religion annual meeting in Chicago late last year. So I'll pass over to Dusty. Lynn Davidman is Robert M. Barron Distinguished Professor of Modern Jewish Studies and Professor of Sociology at the University of Kansas. She also serves on the advisory board of the Center for the Study of Religion at Princeton University. Informed by qualitative sociological methods, ethnography, and social theory, her research career has focused on the central questions of how people make sense of their lives after major, unexpected biographical disruptions, and how, through research interviews, interviewees construct narratives that establish coherence between events before and after such life transformations. In her studies, David Men is especially attuned to gender and religion, and she frequently interweaves autobiographical data into her presentation and analyses. David Men has written three books. Tradition in a Rootless World, Women Turn to Orthodox Judaism, Mother Loss, and the recently published Becoming Unorthodox, Stories of Ex-Hasidic Jews, as well as the co-edited volume with Shelley Tenenbaum, Feminist Perspectives on Jewish Studies. For this interview, we focus on the concepts of conversion and deconversion, illustrations of these processes in various contexts, what each term means and how each is experienced in someone's life, the histories of these terms and their use in scholarship, and issues that arise from their conceptualization or use. Thank you, Lynn, for agreeing to talk with us today. It's a pleasure. Well, maybe we, we start out at the beginning with what is conversion and how has it been conceived of and used by scholars? Okay. So the first thing I say is, here I'm very much influenced by Geertz, Clifford Geertz, that things are local. And so, what is conversion depends very much on the context of what it is you're converting into. So I think that when scholars try to come up with a universal definition, all conversion experiences have involved in them, like this moment of a great insight or something, sort of Paul on the road to Tarsus becoming Saul, or Saul becoming Paul. I think that conversion is more diverse than we typically allow for, and most notions of conversion have been taking on a set of beliefs. And I think if you look at Judaism, it's more the set of practices that you're taking into. And I think if you're thinking about Haitian Catholicism and Voodoo, conversion is a syncretistic movement. And so I would want to say that, yes, we do talk about conversion, and I do as well, and I use a lot of conversion theory in my first book. But I think by this stage in my life or in my career, I would want to parse out conversion to what, under what circumstances. Uh, earlier in our, in our conversation, before the interview, we talked about uh, the trajectory of the study of conversion and the influence in the 1970s of new religious movements. Uh, can yes. you talk about kind of the before and after of, of that phenomenon and the study of that phenomenon in the study of conversion? Sure. Um, I think that up through the 40s and 50s, a lot of sociology religion was this kind of count them up church members and maybe count them up synagogue members and not very substantive into the processes going on in religious communities or in people's religious experiences. And the arrival of new religious movements totally lit a fire on your sociology religion and provided lots of fascinating new things to study. And in that context, conversion usually meant becoming a member of a group who, whom you hadn't been familiar with, with whom you hadn't been familiar before. It meant taking on a new worldview. It meant taking on new practices, dressing differently. Um, those conversions often involved a very powerful religious leader. Um, 
to whom people in the group all believed they had a special relationship with. Um, and people wanted to know sort of the underlying question, the subtext was, why the hell would these American kids want to become Jew boots or walk around in orange robes and sell flowers at the airport and stuff? And I think people were genuinely puzzled and mystified by the process. And so a lot of that work was originated by simply the impulse to understand why, why is this and why now? And I remember a book by What Now, and I'm one of What Now's greatest living fans. <laughs> but he wrote this book, The Consciousness Reformation. I don't know if you know it. And but let me unset, I was too young to know it at the time, but years later going back to it. When people when I finished my first book and people said, Well, why do these people join and not others? And I said, It's a question I can't answer with my methods. Because the people becoming Orthodox Jews live in these high-rise New York City apartments, where they, or some of them, where they moved in expecting they'd get married and then move to the birds or New Jersey and raise families. And it didn't happen. They happened into the synagogue during a time of special need or a holiday or something. Well, during that time, there were a lot of uh, studies that were proposing various models Yes, uh, or, process models. Or yeah, models. exactly. Stages of conversion, right. for example, and lots of different versions of the different stages, for yes, example. Yes, a lot of different versions. One person's had eight, one person's had ten, that kind of thing. I found some more interesting work at that time to be the work on processes, such as Larry Grile and David Rudy's work on social cocoons and on the concept of encapsulation. So it's how do conversionary groups get members in and have them stay in. And encapsulation is huge in that, both ideological or tricky ideological, social, social and um, physical. And I found that stuff a little more interesting because it rather explained things, whereas if you have a process not, oh, I know, remember, People would say to me, well, why do these people join and not others? And our methods aren't designed to answer that. And so people would say to me, why do these women join and other Jewish women don't, who might find themselves in the same life spaces? And it's like, well, to answer that, I would have to go into the same high-rise buildings and post notices. Are you Jewish? Are you in your late 20s, early 30s? Are you looking for family? What did you do? You know, and it's not a tenable, and that's also why I shy away from why questions, because it implies a motive. The A motives are not static, but if you say a motive, it sounds static, and also because I'm not in a position to explain why some people and not others, unless I do direct comparisons. But then the sample of Jewish women in New York who could end up in Lincoln Square, where synagogue is in. In it. And so who would I meaningfully pick as a comparison group? So I'm much more comfortable saying how and what happens in the process and how do people describe it instead of saying why, because why implies a comparison with those who don't. And the process model is a, is a shift too. You mentioned earlier the, the, the conversionary narrative of Saul becoming Paul as a sudden event. Right, so this is a process rather than an event, uh, active agency, not always just passive. So that happens to you, right? That seems to be a, a shift in the in the conversation. Absolutely. Um, your work has explored. You mentioned those three dimensions: physical, uh, ideological, and uh, social. Social, uh, and you know, thinking about different religious traditions in the, in the Protestant tradition. Conversion was traditionally conceived as a matter of belief, and in Absolutely. other traditions, it's a matter of practice or behaviors and rituals that need to be learned as as much or perhaps more importantly than a belief. Um, yes. And social networks and relationships. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if you could illustrate with um, some of your work uh, some of those processes that, uh, in the concrete. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the, so like Graham Moody also talked about processes then. And 
Book Rao wrote in one of his articles, he's a very good friend of mine, and he wrote one of his articles, it's conversion is coming to take the point of view of your new reference group or of your new friends. And I think that's a lot of what it is, that it's a social interactional process by which a person gets introduced to somebody or somebodies who are living interesting lives and want to know more about it, or who are talking about things that grab your attention, and you start hanging out with them and learning more about what they are, what they're doing, and eventually you start to become more like them. And that makes sense to me, rather than a sudden stroke, freaking moment, or a clear distinctive motive that never changes. But rather, it's, in the context of my studies, the women who became orthodox, or if you will, converted in, did so out of reasons of proximity. So they were near Lincoln Square, they happened to live near there, and so that was one of the things. Also, because of people they met, so the women who went to the Lubavitch Institute often met a Lubavitcher outreach worker. You could call them missionaries, but the Jews would roll over in their graves <laughs> over that. Um, who stops them on the street and says, you Jewish, you know, if it's a woman who gives her candles for Shabbat, it's a man tries to put those phylacteries, leather straps on them. And if you're at a place where you're looking for a lot of guidance, Lubavitchers take you under their wing. And then they'll suggest for women, oh, you must go to Beislana, the place I studied in Minnesota. You must go there. You'll just learn so much, and the people there are so great. And so it's a process of recruitment. And people say Jews don't proselytize, but they don't to non-Jews. They will to Jews. And I think there's this underlying assumption that most Jews all Jews have some little spark of a Jewish soul in them, and Jewish meaning religious. And so, if only we could touch that. Um, your your work as well has uh, looked at the, the in, in the processes of, of conversion, looked at narratives and, and language changes. Uh, yes. And and you've uh, interwoven as well uh, kind of examinations of new embodied practices, as we mentioned, the physical. Um, could you also describe, um, for example, what what changes in the scholarship led you to pay attention to those? Was that something that came from new scholarly frames, that, or was that from the data on the ground? You're that like, this came is... from the data on the ground when I started this. Most, I mean, now that I look back, I can see that in my first book. So the women at Beis Hanu would write to their mothers and say, send me new clothing with long skirts and long sleeves. And clearly they were changing their bodily practices to become orthodox. But I didn't really see that then. It didn't leap up at me. And it was not until long into I'd been analyzing this data that it leapt up. And how do things link up? You know, like Paul... And that moment of seeing things. But as I went through all my interviews, they all focused on physical dimensions of leaving and of becoming. That it was, you couldn't understand leaving a Hasidic life without understanding changes in how people acted, performed, comported themselves, their demeanor, the whole bit in that world. And I came to think that this particular group highlights in high relief what you could see in many groups, but because for them it's so much part of the minute, every day, the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep, it really becomes obvious. And once I found it, I see other people are writing about it too. So Sean wrote a book about you know, social theory in the body, and I started reading it. But I came to it naive. I wonder if you could flesh out some of the, the theoretical work on agency versus structure here in, in terms of conversion, because there's uh, norms for a community that you're in, and as you 
leave that community or and enter into a new world, there's a new set of norms and expectations, right? So there's socialization pressures, structures, as well as individual agency motivations, push-pull factors, biography, mm -hmm. life cycle, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, not sure if I have more to add than to what I wrote about that. Um, let me think for a minute. Ask me the kernel of it again, please. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering uh, how how to balance that agency and, mm. and structure in thinking about uh, conversion or entering a, a religious world as well as deconverting or leaving a, a particular re religious world. I think that leaving involves really seizing your own individual agency. And as I wrote about in this recent book, it means becoming an individual. Hasidim as true individualism. And I had found that in my first book as well, where the, and I spoke about this briefly this morning, the rabbi would say, you think you have so many choices, but you only have so many. And it's a denial of choice. You think anyone could be president, but really that's not true. You only have a few options you really could do. So Let's say they get married. I mean, there's an example right out of the book, right out of what he said. Let's say they get married and he has an allergy and they have to move to Arizona. Well, she's not going to think he's ruining her life because of his allergies. Rather, that's what you do as a wife. You go. And so there's a lot of socialization into roles and a lot of de emphasis on your individual will. Your individual will does not matter, Rabbi Beslan has said. You are here to fulfill God's will. And the sooner you realize that, the sooner you'll be in harmony with who you really are. And so I think that in coming in, structure provides, you have to have agency to walk. You have to have agency to go into a synagogue you've never gone into, not knowing Hebrew, hearing language, songs in Hebrew, and you're an adult and you feel competent in your work world, but all of a sudden you feel pretty dumb there because you're a Jew, you think you should know this, but you don't. So there's definitely agency that pulls people in. But once you start becoming, structure provides a lot of part of the socialization. Whereas in leaving, at least in the group I studied, it means individuating and seizing agency away from these intense structures that um, shaped your whole life. I'd like to, so we've already kind of shifted the conversation towards uh, what has been labeled deconversion. Um, Heinz Stribe recently wrote a book called Deconversion, looking at this, and it's been discussed under, under a number of different terms, from apostasy to alienation, disaffiliation, defection, exit, leaving, etc. And so part of the question is already, uh, 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 part of the answer perhaps is already loaded in the question, but how has this process been studied uh, as well? How has it been conceived of by scholars? And I think scholars have used different terminology both depending on their goals and depending on the groups they studied. So Helen Roseybell was a Columbia graduate student of Merton, and Merton wanted to find the rules like Durkheim. What could we talk about in every instance in which, and it's a totally opposite to the Iberian approach, which relies on Verstehen and says each case is the same. Not the same. They were Durkheim defined religion within the first 50 or 70 pages of his book, whereas Weber wrote books about every major world religion until he died, and he still couldn't come up with a single definition of religion. So Helen Rose Ebau set out to find out what do all experiences of becoming an ex have in common, which is a structural approach and leaves out the Geertzian love of the particular. And I've approached my work more moving from the very specific, the very local, outward to the larger set of issues. Um, apostasy is clearly a Christian-biased term, 
and I imagine that that term might be used by people who don't like Christians leaving the community or the faith. I have found, I've had to do a lot of educating that Judaism is not a faith tradition, because everybody talks about it as that, and I say, no, you can't talk about Judaism that way. It really shows a Christian bias, because in becoming a Christian, the most central thing you can do is make a statement about accepting Jesus Christ inside you as your Lord and Savior. There are no faith claims required in becoming Orthodox or no denials necessary in leaving, but it's rather orthopraxis which matters. So apostasy is a term related to beliefs and wouldn't apply to Jews at all. I mean, heretic would apply to Jews, and Jews have been so excommunicated for heresy like Spinoza, but Mostly Jews don't get excommunicated these days. Their ideas aren't that important to anybody. Well, and that, that criticism applies equally well to the term conversion, to the word deconversion, or right. when we think of quote-unquote missionary religions, right? The, Absolutely. Yeah. And that is one of my pet peeves. And in this recent book, I tell a story about being at, I think it's in the conclusion, I was at an invited-only conference at... Um, University of Southern California, where Paul, Nina Lyasov and Paul, I guess his last name is, and it was on a Sunday, and so people woke up and said, good morning, good morning, you know, they started the day, and somebody said, can somebody tell me what we're all doing here on a Sunday? I said, I have no problem with that. And I felt excluded by that question, and I don't take offense at that anymore. I just pipe up and say, you're biased. I don't say it that way, of course, but I have no problem being there on a Sunday. Why should I? So what kind of assumption are you making about Sunday as a universal holiday or Sabbath for all peoples? It doesn't even apply to all Christians. So do you think this is just a linguistic issue? We just need to think about a different word, or oh, is it no, something no, else? No, yeah. I think it's something much deeper. Because if you talk a language of faith traditions, which many people use, it's not just the word. You could call it belief traditions. You could call it idea traditions. But the idea is that what's primary are the ideas. And I think that that's a fundamentally different way of seeing religion and of asking questions about it and analyzing it that has assumptions about faith embedded in it that don't apply to all religions. And people, if you will, and this is not my ideal choice of words, if I was writing, I'd go back and copy edit, but people don't see how biased it is because it's dominant in the culture. Christianity is so dominant in this culture that when people study religion, they think that they're studying, even if they know they're not, but the Christian, Christianity provides the norm. And the assumptions about what it means to be a Christian shapes and shapes. I want to ask, uh, your work is also focused on gender and illuminating the, the role of gender and the uh, issues that are uh, that arise for scholars who are looking at conversion or leaving or exiting processes uh, uh, plays because it doesn't, these processes are not uniform for women and men and they're certainly also not uniform for all women or for all men. And so I wonder if you could highlight the, 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 the role of gender mm -hmm. in these processes. I would think that perhaps in more mainline Christian denominations, gender may not play as heavy a role as in fundamentalist Christian denominations and communities, as in Muslim communities, or Hindu communities, or Jewish ones. So I think Jewish communities, Hindu, Islamic communities, for them gender is really huge. 
and the whole community is based on and built up from notions of distinctive gendered identities, selves, and roles. So the roles derive from this sense of what the essence of being male or female are. And I think in some of the more mainline Christian denominations, that's faded over time. But with Jews and Muslims, it's essential. So if you convert into one of those groups, part of what you're re-socialized to learn is what it means to be a gendered being in that world. And at both communities I studied when women were joining, they were really being re-socialized into notions of femininity and what it means not only to be a good Jew, but a good Jewish woman or man. And it's interesting because some studies have been done that find, well, what does it mean to be a good Jew and, or a good person? And those, and that's not just about Jews. And all of those assume the good man. A good Jew is a good Jewish man. And a good person is what a man would be doing, etc. And we say, well, what if a woman was like that? Well, no, that doesn't quite apply. And similarly in leaving, and Mary Jo alluded to that some and discussed it in terms of leaving. And it was very striking to me as I listened to the trans interviews over and over that many of the men found their exit routes through scholarly questioning because that's what had been emphasized their whole lives. Not that it took on all the men in the community. Some people are more inclined to intellectual work and others not. And some of the men I spoke to who felt really cast out as kids because they weren't good at school. That, for them, was part of the start of the cracks in the eggs. But um, the men are trained to study and question and argue all day long, which is another physical change. When you walk into a library, a public library, it's hushed. Whereas in a male study hall, they're always working in dyads, and they're always arguing with each other. Well, this could really mean this, or this could really mean this, and then around. You know, and there's this movement and this sing song tongue through which they do it, all of which is embodied. And so to become a person who can sit in libraries means thinking about learning in a very different way. So men who are trained to question sneak into libraries, they discover Einstein or Hegel or theories of relativism. And it makes the absoluteness of the worldview they've been shown come into question. The worldview they've imbibed come into question. Well, wait a minute. If things are really relative, then how can I believe this is absolute truth? And so some men came to their questioning through those means. But I'll also say men have a little more degrees of freedom in their movement. So some would walk into hotel lobbies and watch TV. I heard a few Israeli men talk about that, that they learned to watch TV as one of the first things by hotel lobbies or something. And women were more likely to leave, either because they couldn't see themselves staying and becoming like their mothers, one of my interviewees, Leo, was so strongly articulate about that. She was passionate about it. What would I become? I didn't want to be my mother. What other models did I have available to me? None. And so they leave partly as a resistance to that. And some fine men were also questioning, and they leave together. And so they're, they are leaving according to their socially accepted role. I have a, a final question here, that which you've kind of alluded to at the beginning of your answer to this last one, and that's in, in thinking about uh, conversion or, or deconversion. That of course, there's words are problematic uh, and they don't just imply ontological differences. These new acts of identification. Are, are illustrative as well of identity transformations Absolutely. or of new ways of articulating identity in particular contexts. And performing identity. And performing. And so I'm wondering if you could discuss, maybe abstract a little bit now from just 
the sociological conversation or anthropological conversation around conversion and deconversion to larger discussions around identity? Well, in the book, and it was mentioned this morning, I, I heard, as I listened to what the people I spoke with had to say, there's so much in common with GLBTQ bodily twin transformation because it's also an embodied transformation. How you comport yourself, how you move your body, how you don't move your body, what you move away from. So there's both a set of ideals, the meta-narrative, heteronormativity, like for the Orthodox, the, the set of ideals is God took us out of Egypt and that's the narrative, the meta-narrative that goes along with the bodily practices. For people coming out LGBTQ, um, they're challenging a set of ideas and a way of embodying those ideas as taken for granted by challenging them and beginning to change those aspects of yourself. Well, thank you so much. I, I should add here uh, quickly that you alluded several times as well to a conversation we had earlier on the Author Meeks Critics panel session on your new book, Becoming Unorthodox, here at the Association for the Sociology of Religion Conference in Chicago. Uh, so I just wanted to, for listeners, that they'll know what the, the context was for those comments. Right, that was and a wonderful I referred book. to it, yeah. Yeah, Thank wonderful. you. This was fun. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and uh, take care. You too. Thanks very much for that interview there, Dusty. Great to hear from you again, and great to hear these concepts being talked about. Um, it's always quite interesting the, the way that there's a, a sort of normative presumption of religiosity in these terms. And we never really talk about people lapsing into religion from their otherwise you know, rational states or something. It's always you know, people maybe lapse from their faith equally. We can say people are maybe lapsing into religiosity at times of strife if we don't presume that um, normative religiosity. Absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, so I'm particularly thinking of older people who turn to religion upon the death of their partner, for instance. I mean, it's, it's a conversion narrative rather than a deconversion. Mm. Although, as uh, David Vos would point out, um, although there is that common narrative of... Um, people get more religious when they get older. You, you would point out that the data shows that there's definitely a generational shift and that as the as younger people get less and less, quote, religious, unquote, that they aren't suddenly deciding to be religious when they get older. Well, uh, isn't the data also there, though, that they get more conservative as they get older? And there's definitely a link between conservatism, hmm. um, you know, small c conservatism and uh, and... Um, religious faith. Yeah. If nothing else, it's identification hmm. with pre-existing traditions. But there's a, a, ne a need to have been primed, in a sense, with the uh, traditions. And um, as, and I, again, I'm reifying lots of things here. But I, I, as, as parents pass on less traditions to their children, so the children, you, you, you don't just pick up religion from nowhere. Basically, would be mm -hmm. Vos's argument. Mm -hmm. But um, read David Vos and Siobhan McAndrew on that. We never mentioned... And, and listen to our interview with David Vos from way back, like number 15 or something. Yeah, on uh, quantitative approaches. So next week's podcast, as this week's, as every podcast, is presented in association with the British Association for the Study of Religions. And since January, we've also been coming to you in association with the North American Association for the Study of Religion. And that's not to mention a small bit of support that we get from the Australian Association as well. So we're becoming a truly international project and we're very grateful to all our sponsors and we're especially grateful to those of you at home who contribute by using our Amazon links .co.uk, .com and .ca which really do contribute a significant amount to the project. Don't forget our poster competition. If you're a budding designer, um, get along to the site and um, show us what you can do. We're looking for posters, uh, designs of posters, advertising the Religious Studies Project, um, and we're going to share these on our social media. And the best ones, or the most popular one, is going to be produced, printed, and mailed to every department in the world in order to promote not only the Religious Studies Project, but this academic study of religion worldwide. Yeah. And hopefully to bring in new people into the project. Yeah, and you, and you might want to think in your designs that um, not just posters, but if it's the right kind of design, we might, you, know, you might be seeing it in 
conference guides and whatnot in years to come. So really getting your work out there. So yeah, just bear that in mind. So yeah, a great opportunity for anybody who's interested in the design side of things. Um, we're, we look forward to seeing your design. As always, send them to editors at religiousstudiesproject.com and you can send any comments, questions, contributions, criticisms, and other words starting with C to that Currency. Email. And currency to... Uh, to editors at religiousstudiesproject.com. As always, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, I think on Google+, certainly on YouTube, um, on iTunes, we've already mentioned our Amazon pages, and at the website where we encourage you to comment and on each post as it comes. But as ever, until next week, thanks for listening. <laughs>